Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now and we commit these moments to you, asking that, Lord, you would, through your Spirit, clearly reveal your Word. We pray, Father, that we would be mindful of what your Word says, that we would be eager to receive it into our hearts, and that, Lord, through it, you would transform us and make us more faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, as we look at Psalm 1 together, I want to draw your attention to the idea of discipleship, especially as it relates to uh, deeper roots, growing deeper in your commitment, growing, growing deeper as a follower of Jesus Christ. And um, it seems as though there's usually three answers to most Sunday school questions. Now, let's see if we can get them right. The first one is always... That's right. It's always Jesus. Jesus is number one question, or number one answer to any question in Sunday school. But then there's always, it's kind of a combo, Bible reading and prayer, right? So those are the, you got the, the theological answer, then you've got the practical application kind of answers. What, how, how can you fix any problem in your life? Well, it's Bible reading and prayer, of course it is. But the truth is, it really is the case. Bible reading and prayer are essential to the life of of a disciple. And so many times those are the things that get overlooked. We treat them as though that was something we did a long time ago. That's kind of like the beginner steps. But if we're not consistently in the Word of God, consistently in prayer, then friends, we're not growing as disciples of Jesus Christ. So this morning I want us to focus on this idea of devoting ourselves to the Word of God, growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And um, as I begin, I was, I was always actually reading past um, on, on, on Charles Spurgeon. If you've never read Charles Spurgeon's Morning and Evenings, uh, it's his daily devotional. You need to pick up a copy and you need to read through that on a daily basis. At least go through it one year. But in, in his reading, uh, he was speaking about this idea of devoting yourself to the Lord. And he says these words. He says, Come away has no harsh sound in it to my ear. For what is there to hold me in this wilderness of vanity and sin? My Lord, would that I could come away. Listen to what he says. But I am captive among the thorns and cannot escape from them as I desire. I would, if it were possible, have neither eyes nor ears nor heart for sin. You call me to yourself by saying, come away. And this is a melodious call indeed. To come to you. To come home from exile, to come to a land out of the raging storm, to come to rest after long labor, to come to the goal of my desire and the summit of my wishes. But Lord, how can a stone rise? How can a lump of clay come away from the horrible pit? And he says, oh, raise me, draw me, your grace can do it. Send forth thy Holy Spirit to kindle sacred flames of love in my heart, and I will continue to rise until I leave life and time behind me and indeed come away. Friends, that is the call that Jesus gives to each of us. We live day to day to day, and so many times we, we make no effort, no room in our busy schedules to come away to spend quality time with the Lord, to devote ourselves to Him. Now, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ, 
the, the whole point of being a disciple is becoming like the one you're following. That's the whole point of discipleship. So when we look at the life of Jesus, we look at a man who is also God, but felt that it was important enough for him that he would go away and devote himself quietly to the Word and to, or, or to thinking and, and to praying to God. Mark records this in his gospel. He says that Jesus, rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he would depart and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. Now, should we be any different? Should we be any different? If we are not God in flesh, how much more so do we need to devote ourselves to the Word and to prayer? Would you say that you regularly pull away from the demands of your world, the stresses of your job, the pressures of relationships, the piling up of projects? Would you say that you pull away regularly from those things? Drop those burdens and come to the Lord in a solitary place to personally meet with your God. Friends, if you're followers of Jesus Christ, what I mean by that is if, if you have acknowledged your sin, if the Holy Spirit has revealed to you the magnitude of your sin and you've seen that problem, you've seen the outcome of that kind of life and instead you've turned in repentance, trusting in the gospel of Jesus Christ in that Jesus Christ died on a cross for your sins so that you could have His righteousness and by believing and trusting in Him He has raised you up and one day when He returns He will resurrect your dead body and you will live for eternity in Him. If you believe believe those things, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, how much more so should we go to Him? Come away. Spend time with Him. How much more so should we model our lives after Christ if we're a follower? As we look at this psalm together, Psalm 1, immediately, many of us maybe want to say that Jesus is the blessed man. We look at this text And most of us probably think, well, it's not talking about me. I rest assured, it's not talking about me. But we say, well, it's talking about Jesus. Jesus is the blessed man. I mean, after all, Jesus was the perfect Israelite. He was the one that fulfilled all of the commandments. Jesus was the one who fulfilled all of the law. He was God in flesh. He never sinned. Completely delighted in God and in God's law. But oftentimes what happens is when we look at this passage or a passage like this, We know that we cannot truly be perfect ourselves, and so then we just kind of skip by it. We neglect the weight and the power of what this verse or this scripture is saying to us. Psalm 1 helps us to understand why being in the Word and being a person of prayer on a daily basis, having a quiet time, having a devotional life, having a, a personal rendezvous with Christ every day, it tells us why that is so vital to the Christian life, and to discipleship. So I want us to look at three elements in this psalm. Uh, The first thing is that we must notice that all of us are influenced. Now some of us are influencers, but all of us are influenced. Look what he says there in verses 1 and 2. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, each of us has different kinds of influence in our lives. All of us are influenced by people, we're influenced by circumstances, we're influenced by information. Nick Bilton, who was writing for the New York Times, he he wrote these, these words. He said, the average American consumes 34 gigabytes of content and 100,000 words of information in a single day. Now, this doesn't mean that they read 100,000 words a day. It means that 100,000 words cross our eyes and ears every single 24-hour period. That information comes through various channels. comes through television, comes through radio, comes through cell phones, comes through text, comes through internet, video games. It comes through all kinds of different things. We are always, it seems like, distracted by the things that are happening around in our life. Hold on a second, let me check my email. It's a little more distracting when I do it, isn't it? But the truth is, a quarter of you have already checked something on your phone in the time that I've been up here. 
And three quarters of you will have done so by the end of this message. The truth is we are distracted people. We have all kinds of information at our fingertips. The truth is that uh, we receive more information in one day living in the 21st century than a person living in the 19th century would have ever received in their entire lifetime. We are flooded with information. All kinds of information comes over us every single day through digital form, through, through, uh, through, through physical books, whatever it be, magazines. We have all kinds of things in our life that are speaking into our lives and influencing us. Now, if you were to think about the, maybe the three most influential elements in your life, maybe, maybe it's a relationship that you had. Maybe it was a circumstance. Maybe it was a, a parent who poured into your life at a very young age and taught you the things of Scripture, taught you uh, how to walk and follow after God. Maybe, maybe it's a radio program on a regular basis, on a daily basis. You spend 30 minutes listening to this radio pra- program, and it influences the way that you think, the way that you understand your world. Or maybe it's a news program you watch at night. Maybe it's, maybe it's your favorite magazine. You've been reading this same magazine for years and it's challenged you to become a better fisherman or whatever. But it's, it's done something for your life. It's influenced you. Maybe, maybe in your life, maybe it was a tragedy that happened early on. Maybe some sort of really difficult circumstance, a loss of some kind. And that tragedy has shaped then the trajectory of your life. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was growing up poor or maybe growing up affluent. Maybe it was some kind of moral code. Whatever it is, all of us are influenced by a variety of different things. We have all kinds of influence coming in on us. And that's what we see this psalmist talking about. Here we see two individuals being contrasted. There is the cursed man, the unblessed man, and the blessed man. And there's a contrast here. I want you to notice, first of all, the cursed man, the unblessed man. And we see that there is this progression He says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So this unblessed man, this cursed man, he has this progression that is happening for him. He's walking, he's standing, and finally he is sitting and walking in the counsel of the wicked. Now the counsel of the wicked, if we replace the word counsel with, say, the word advice, maybe it's a little bit clearer for us. The, the, the man or the woman following after Christ, disciples of Jesus Christ, we ought not be walking in the way, in the same direction as the ungodly. We ought not to be walking in the same direction as those who are not following after Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives this illustrative story, a parable if you will, and he, he says that uh, this entering into the kingdom of God is like entering through a gate. He says that there are two gates. One gate is narrow. It's a very narrow gate. And the path that extends beyond that gate is a very hard path. It's a stony path. It's a difficult path. It's a winding path. It's a path where you might twist and turn your ankle. It's a hard way to go. He says, but the other way is this wide gate. It's a wide gate. And the path that extends beyond it is also a wide path. It's a comfortable path. It's a smooth path. He says, but the problem is... Many are going down this way thinking that it's going to lead to good things. But both of them have different outcomes. The narrow gate, the hard path, leads to life. And the wide gate, the wide and comfortable path, leads to death. So as disciples of Jesus Christ, we cannot be walking in the same way as those who are not following after Christ. We're walking in the same way as them then we're walking down a path that leads to death and not a path that leads to life. Listening to the advice of the world, the wisdom of the world, means that we're going to begin interpreting our life and our world by the things that they say and not by what God says. William Herbert describes the American way of life like this. He says, The American way of life is individualistic. It's dynamic. Pragmatic. It, it affirms the supreme value of dignity of the individual. It stresses incessant activity on his part. For he is never to rest, but is always to be striving to get ahead. It defines an ethic of self-reliance, merit, and character. And judges by achievement. Deeds, not creeds, are what count. 
The American believes in progress, in self-improvement, and quite fanatically in education. But above all, the American is idealistic. Now, the truth is, some of us in this room, if we'd have been quite honest just a moment ago, we would have said, America, that's right, America. Those are the things that we live and breathe on. Those are the things that we've been bred to think. Those are the things that, that's, that's the character qualities of our life. That's what my parents taught me. That's what the American flag means. And, when, and we, we, we look at our life and it's, it's challenged by those kinds of principles. So is the way that you interpret the world, is it an American interpretation of the world? Or is it a biblical interpretation of the world? What does the Bible say? The Bible says that we, we ought not be that individualistic. We ought to be sharing the burdens of others. We ought to be focused on the community of Christ. We are like a body. We're to be united. We ought to be standing out and doing things for ourselves, but we're to be doing things for one another. The Bible says that we should rest from our labors. Rest from our labors and trust instead in the sovereignty of God, the goodness of God. The Bible says that we should be content in whatever state the Lord has placed us in. The Bible says that we ought not be self-reliant, but we ought to be reliant on Him. The Bible says that it's not by merit. It's not by the things that we do. It's not uh, sola bootstrapa, pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. It's not that. It's grace. It's always grace. The Bible says that our character is flawed, and we must trust then in the character of another, our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says it's not all about our achievements, but instead it's about the achievements of of Jesus Christ. See, the blessed man walks not in the counsel of the world, the wicked. But look at the next step. The cursed man, he stands in the way of sinners. Stands in the way of sinners. If we walk by the instructions of the world, we will eventually become idly passive and we'll stop. We'll pause. And we'll stand in the way that seems right to us in our own eyes. And that's not the way of discipleship. We talked at length in January about what it means to live your life in a way that seems right in your own eyes. See, we hear, we hear we see the focus shifts from the advice offered by the godless to, to their lifestyle. Now they're standing in this way of sinners, the, the lifestyle, the, the patterns, those are the things that you begin to do in your life. And so as a disciple, we cannot stand in a path lingering with those who do not want to honor God. Those who do not want to follow after Jesus Christ. The final step is sitting. So you see, he's walking along, standing, pausing, and then finally sitting down in the way of scoffers, in the seat of scoffers. This is the final step in the progression. To sit suggests you're going to remain with them for a while. You're going to take up some room with them. You're going to enjoy their company. But as disciples, we cannot become comfortable with those who continually scoff at God. And scoff means to, to verbally malign God. It means to be sarcastic, disrespectful of God. It means to mock the goodness and the glory and the honor of God. And scoffing happens sometimes also without our voice. Oftentimes we're tempted to scoff God, to dishonor God, not with our voice, not with the things that we say, but by the actions of our life. We silently scoff God when we refuse to do the things that He's told us to do. Or we do the things that He's told us not to do. Scoffing is really the opposite of worship. The psalmist describes scoffing this way in Psalm 42. He says, And with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long where is your God scoffing at it so this is the progression of the cursed man walking standing sitting now notice the blessed man the blessed man does the opposite of this does the opposite of the cursed man the blessed man walks in the counsel or the advice of the righteous the cursed man walks in the counsel of the ungodly. The blessed man walks in the counsel and the advice of the righteous. Now this is supremely through the word of our God. Through the prophets and through the apostles. The blessed man is hearing the word of God. Listening to the word of God. Reading the word of God. Absorbing the word of God. But it's also through the counsel 
of those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Your pastors, your deacons, your leaders, your Sunday school teachers, those who are standing before you or sitting before you and, and, and speaking God's word to you, family and friends who are, who are godly people listening to the word of God and, and then giving you good, wise counsel. Blessed man walks in that way. Down the narrow, down the, through the narrow gate, down the hard path with brothers and sisters together. The next is the blessed man stands Not in the way of sinners, but he stands in the way of saints. So not only does he listen to godly counsel, advice from God's word and God's people, but he begins to pattern his life after them. He's looking at them as models and saying, this is the thing that I want to do. This is how I'm going to to behave. This is the kind of things that I'm going to say. These are the kind of actions that I'm going to perform. This is the way I'm going to serve. And his heart has changed His mind is changed. His behaviors are changed. And finally, the blessed man sits in the seat of worshipers, not scoffers. He receives godly counsel. He changes the pattern of his life in accordance with God and His Word through the power of the Holy Spirit. And finally, he praises the Lord with his life, with his voice. But what is it that the psalmist points to as being the activity that sets the tone for these changes in his life. What is it? Look down. Verse 2, he says, but his delight, his desire, his, his pleasure is in the law of the Lord. How did all of this happen? It's through the law of the Lord. This man, he has a, he has a deep, abiding affection for the word of God. Friends, this ought to be convicting for us. It is for me. Do do you have a a deep, abiding affection for the Word of God? Or do you sometimes go for days before you even open it up? The reason that my family were here this weekend is because we had our 10-year reunion with the guys that I went to, I guess guys and gals, we went to Iraq with in the 2175th Military Police Company. And um, so we had our 10-year reunion. We came in and, and got to see everybody. It was a really nice time over in Sinclair yesterday. But when I was in Baghdad serving with those guys, we would be out doing missions in Baghdad on the day. And, I mean, it's just extremely hot. I mean, 135-degree temperatures in the daytime. And you get back and you're just toast. You're done. You don't want to do anything else. You're wore out. You're exhausted. So I'd go in my room, and as I'd enter into my room, I I would look down at my cot there, and about every once a week, I'd look down, and then there would be one or two letters. They're blue, sometimes yellow letters, or envelopes. And so I would sit down on my cot immediately, and I would begin looking at these envelopes. And I'd, I mean, just scour the envelopes. You know, sometimes I'd smell them. Because that person was spraying stuff on him. And I don't know how it lasted from like Missouri to Baghdad, but they still smelled good. And so I would look at them and I would look at the handwriting and I would know who they were from. And, and I would look on the back because she always made sure that I would read them in the right order. And so she would put numbers on them and circle the numbers. And, and then I would open the letters up in order and I would begin to read them. And I would read them. I'd spend all afternoon, all the time that I had just reading them. And I'd reread them, and I would think about them, and I'd laugh, and I'd maybe cry, and I'd look at them again, and I would read them again. And do you think that I, I spent all that time reading those letters because I just, you know, I love reading letters. I mean, any letter I could get my hands on, I just I want to read it. And it doesn't matter if it's for me or for anybody else. It's just a letter. I want to read that letter. Or, or maybe it's because I just love diagramming sentences. I just, I mean, I, that's amazing, you know, tremendous teasing out all of these nuances in the English language. No. Why did I want to read these letters? It's because of the person that wrote them. I delighted in the person that wrote them. It was my wife. I wanted to hear what was happening in her life. I wanted to hear her voice through the pen and paper. I wanted to know what was happening with her. I missed her. I delighted in her. Friends, it's the same. The Word of God has been written to us by God Himself, through the prophets and the apostles, and He's writing to you. We ought to delight in Him. 
He's the one that has rescued us from the bondage of sin. Friends, it doesn't matter if you're a reader or not. It doesn't matter if you like diagramming sentences or not. It doesn't matter if you like to read. It doesn't matter if you're busy. It doesn't matter if you're tired or overworked. You will find time. You will find energy to do the things that you delight in. The question is, do you delight in God? If you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you want to be the blessed man, if you want to be the happy person in God, then you must be about His Word. The psalmist says that we must meditate on the Word of God. He says meditate on it day and night. Now the word meditate really just means to murmur. Now some of you talk to yourself. We know you're out there. Some of you talk to yourself. What he's saying is you need to talk to yourself about the Word. Don't just talk to yourself about random things throughout the day and people look at you funny. Talk to yourself about the Word. Speak the Word of God to yourself. Meditate on it. Think upon it. God says to Joshua in Joshua 1.8, He says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that God has written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. A friend of mine Don Whitney says that meditation is the key to spiritual growth. Reading, he says, is very good. Don't neglect the reading of God's Word. Don't neglect the hearing of God's Word, coming and hearing God's Word preached, God's Word taught. He says, but meditation is excellent. And he illustrates it by giving this, uh, this kind of image of uh, a teacup. If you were to take and have a glass of tea, you take the tea bag out and you've got the hot water in your teacup and you take that tea bag and you begin to dip it down once. There's a slight change in the water, but it still kind of looks like water. He said that's kind of like reading. You read the Word of God. You hear the Word of God. Maybe you, you listen to a podcast. You uh, go to church and you, and, you know, get into a Bible study and you, you do this and you do that. He said, but, but the key is, if you really want to have a glass of tea, you need to go ahead and just drop that sucker in there. Just let it steep. Just let it sit. And that's what meditation is like. Because then when you pull out the tea bag, now you have a cup of tea. There is transformation that has taken place. And friends, if you want your mind to be transformed by the power of God's Word, it doesn't just happen by reading 10 minutes in the morning. It doesn't just happen by uh, going and hearing a good sermon once a week. You need to be meditating on the Word of God. The best way I've found to meditate on God's Word is by praying through Scripture. Praying through Scripture is not difficult and anyone can do it and you can't mess it up. It's one of the greatest things ever. You allow the Scripture to be the words of your prayer. So we look at the text and we say, it's blessed is the man. And you begin to let that form then the way that you pray. God, I ask that you would help me. I know that I am a, a wicked person. But Lord, I want to be the blessed one. I want to be the one who trusts in you. I want to be the one who follows after you instead of after the things of this world. I want to pray for my children. I want to pray for my wife. I want to pray for my friends. That that would characterize their life. And when you begin to run out of things to talk about in relationship to being that blessed man, then go to the next verse. Letting the words of Scripture dictate where you pray and what you say. That's one really healthy way of meditating on Scripture. A second way is memorizing Scripture. Selecting a verse for the week and memorizing that passage and thinking about that passage and teasing it out, asking what it means, asking what, what God is trying to say to you through that passage of Scripture. Friends, that's how your life and your mind begins to get transformed. Meditation is key to discipleship. So, what will influence you on a daily basis? We've already seen that I mean, you're going to have 100,000 words either through your eyes or through your ears coming through in the next day, how many of those words are going to be God's words? Who is going to be the greatest influence in your life? Is it going to be God or is it going to be the world? And the influence in our lives determines then the fruit that we produce. Look there at verses 3 down to verse 4. He says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. He says the blessed man is like a tree 
planted by living water, planted by streams of water. Now, culturally, what he's talking about is literally saying divisions of water. And, and most likely what he's referring to is this ancient practice of irrigation. In Egypt and other places, in Palestine, uh, they would have these larger rivers and they would have more desolate places out where people were living away from the river. And so they would take these canals and they would dig these canals out from the Nile or from the Jordan River and they would come into these areas where then they would have their plants, where they would have their trees. And so they would direct the water to these trees. And sometimes, even from the canals themselves, they would dig additional irrigation canals that would go to individual plants, individual trees, to make sure that they were getting enough water. Now what's amazing is that the gardener himself intentionally gets the water to the tree. It's not up to the tree. The tree doesn't have to say, you know what, I'm not getting enough water. I think I need to transplant myself. I think I need to do something. I'm about to die. I don't have any water. No, it's the gardener who's looking after the trees and he is intentionally carving out these lanes of water so that the trees get enough to drink. Friends, God has transplanted you from the kingdom of darkness and He's replanted you into the garden, the kingdom of His beloved Son. He's intentionally getting water to you. He's intentionally creating canals of living water to reach you. He's given you all access to His Word. You have it every single day. Hopefully all of us, if not most of us, have this Bible right here in front of us, right here this morning. We have the Word. We have access to sermons. We have access to, to pastors who preach and teach God's Word. Sunday school teachers who lead us in Bible study. We have access to podcasts and websites and all kinds of resources. God's Word is all around us. We ought not think that that's just coincidence. God has sovereignly given to us living water all around us. we look at this tree, the idea of the tree, what does that suggest? It, it suggests strength. Here's a tree living in streams of water flowing around it. It's a strong tree. It's a stable tree. It's a fruitful tree. Beautiful, refreshing, shade. The prophet Jeremiah uses the same kind of imagery when he's talking about the people of Israel. He speaks of the unbeliever as being like a shrub. The believer being like a tree. He says in chapter 17, he says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man. and makes flesh his strength. Sounds a little bit like Psalm 1, doesn't it? Whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabitable salt land. Blessed is the man, he says, who trusts in the Lord whose trust is Yahweh. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green, and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So there you have it. The choice is before you. Are you going to have a, a shrub life kind of life? Or are you going to have a tree life? And the difference is between how deeply we drink from the Word of God. Friends, you are bearing fruit right now. Right here this morning. All of us, we're bearing fruit. The key is we have to determine what kind of fruit we're bearing. Jesus says, He says, For no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor, again, does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. He says, Figs are not gathered from thorn bushes. Nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure of his heart produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. He says, it's two different kinds of trees, they're two different kinds of roots. And those roots determine the kind of fruit. What does the fruit look like? Well, Paul tells us. He says, the bad fruit looks like this. He says, these are the works of the flesh. They're evident, he says. Sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, 
envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. He says, I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the bad fruit. What's the good fruit look like? He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So we have to look at ourselves. What kind of fruit are we bearing? And friends, don't be discouraged when you look at yourself. You have to look at yourself and see what season of life are you in? And oftentimes that will determine the kind of fruit that you're bearing. Do you bear fruit in the hard times? Good fruit, I should say. Do you bear good fruit in the hard times? Do you, do you bear good fruit when, when you should bear the fruit? When it ought to be obvious, when it ought to be evident? When you go through an illness or you lose someone really close to you, when, when you go through a divorce or you lose a job or you have a rocky marriage or you're stressed out at work, what kind of fruit are you bearing? Look what he says. What does it mean when he says that he prospers in everything that he does? Does that mean that he gets the Rolls Royce and everything? Is that what he means? No. What he's saying is he prospers even in the bad times. How? Because he bears fruit. So even in the difficult time, he's bearing fruit. So friends, when, when, what is your response to hateful people at work? What, what's your response to someone who's gossiping against you? How you respond reveals your fruit. If you respond with bitterness and anger and frustration, and you take it out on those around you, that's a definite kind of fruit. But if you respond with compassion and patience and love, that's a godly kind of fruit. Your response to a long, exhausting day at work reveals your fruit. So if you come home and you get angry because somebody needs you to do a project, your spouse says, hey, can you take out the trash? Hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do, uh, take the laundry down? Or you, 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 you have th this desire to have food on the table when you get home and you get frustrated and angry because you feel like you deserve that kind of stuff. That's a definite kind of fruit. But if you come home and you're a servant heart, you want to help, you want to love, that's a different kind of fruit. So we're all of us, we're influenced. We want to be influenced by God. And all of us are producing fruit. We want to produce good fruit. But then finally look at verses 5 and 6. He says, he talks about the outcome of these two trees, these two people. He says, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And we have to be careful to understand that the fruit doesn't determine the outcome. Hear me. The fruit doesn't determine the outcome. So the things that you're doing in your life are not going to determine whether you go to heaven or go to hell. The fruit doesn't determine the outcome. Rather, it's the root that determines the fruit. Where you're connected... The source of your life, if it's Christ, if it's the Word of God, He is going to begin changing you and transforming you so that you produce good fruit. The root produces the fruit. The fruit does not produce or determine the outcome. The fruit is merely the outward expression of what is already happening in your heart. It's like the symptom of the disease, except the opposite. So if you don't see good fruit in your life, then it ought to be a caution to you today as you look at yourself. Why are you not bearing good fruit? Why are you bearing, bearing bad fruit? Are you trusting in Christ? Or are you trusting in yourself? If somebody asks you, why do you think that, that you will be with Christ after the resurrection? What will be your answer? Is it because of something you do? Or is it because of something He has done? For you? Are you repenting of sin on a regular basis? Are you believing the gospel? Are you preaching the gospel to yourself? Are you, are you drinking deeply from the well of God's Word? 
What is the root of your life? The psalmist says that there are two different outcomes. He mentions the chaff and he mentions the wheat. Now in ancient times, he's referring to some ancient farming techniques. They would take the wheat, as they would pull it in, they, they would have these, these stone holes, basically, that they would dig out. And they would have their oxen come through these little areas and trample all of the wheat as they would go through on top of it, and it would separate the wheat from the chaff. And then they would come behind them and they'd take these shovel kind of devices, and they would throw it up in the air, and as the, as the wind would pass over this, this hole, the chaff would separate from the wheat. The wheat, because it was heavier, would fall back to the ground, and the chaff would be blown away, separating it from the wheat. He says, this is the, what happens in the end. Now notice, both the chaff and the wheat had to get stomped by the oxen. But in the end, everything is separated. The chaff is blown away. He says, he says that those who are not following after Christ, they will not receive a positive verdict in the judgment room of God. They will, they will not stand, he says. They will be cast away. They will receive the complete penalty for their sins. But the righteous, he says, they are known by God. They will be given life. Now, all of us here this morning, we mentioned it at the very beginning of this text, we, we have a problem. Because when we look at this passage of Scripture, we don't think it really speaks about us. It speaks about the blessed man, it speaks about maybe Jesus, but it doesn't really speak about us. So we have a problem, don't we? Not a single one of us is here this morning and say, can say with absolute certainty, yes, I am completely righteous. I am a good man. Why? Because the scripture says everything to the contrary. No one is good, not a single person. All of us are by nature wicked. All of us are by, ch by nature children of wrath, the scripture says. So remember, it's the root that's the problem. It's the heart. That's our problem. It's our heart. Jesus says to us in Mark 7, he says, For from within, out of the heart of a man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. It's not the outside that's causing us to be corrupted. It's the inside. We can't be blessed. Because we need a new heart. But that's what God promises in the gospel. That's why we get so excited about the gospel. Because it's in the gospel, God tells us in Ezekiel chapter 36, He says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. He's saying that dirty old heart that you used to have, I'll rip it out. I'll do a, I'll do a transplant. Take that sucker out. I'll give you a new heart that beats for me, that loves me, and a spirit that will cause you to walk in my ways. And it's through this process that God makes us into new creations and He plants us near the streams of living water. Friends, are you going to be the blessed man through Christ? Planted by streams of water, bearing good fruit in its season, prospering in everything that you do. Or are you going to be the cursed who in the end is thrown away by the chaff?